Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. We have uh, about 50 in the room thus far. Um, we're missing two of our speakers, but hopefully they'll be able to join as we begin. Um, I'd like to, to thank the two speakers who have been able to join. Um, my name is Adam Roy Gordon. I lead the US network of the UN Global Compact. It's been a, a really incredible um, day of sessions thus far with some incredible speakers. Uh, and so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining from. We're, we're really pleased to have this be a truly global event. Um, this, this session is being led by, by the US network. Oops. And we're still getting some feedback. Uh, so I've got you on mute again, and hopefully Safna will be able to join. Um, this this session is uh, being led by the, the US network of the UN Global Compact. Um, and what's really um, the unique perspective of the US in many regards, um, but also universal, the role of investors and the, the role of investors in guiding corporate sustainability is a critical consideration, particularly right now as companies are rapidly learning to adapt to the COVID-19 crisis and related crises. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined today by um, three of our four speakers, and hopefully the fourth will join. Um, Evan Harvey, who's the Global Head of Sustainability at NASDAQ. Uh, Michael Frerich, whose name I still have trouble with, who is the treasurer of Illinois. Um, Anna Zubetz Anderson um, from Moody's Credit uh, Analy Analysis. Uh, and then Sapna Shah, um, who's the EVP of Corporate Sustainability at PIMCO, will hopefully um, be joining us shortly as her tech issues get resolved. Um, so I think the first thing to ask is for each of you to introduce yourselves a little more fully than uh, what I've just done. Um, maybe starting with Evan and in the order I introduced you, could you introduce yourselves, your organizations, and um, just at a high level, your organizational approaches to ESG issues? What role do you play in the market? We have very different perspectives on, the, on this panel. Evan? Yeah, I'll go quickly. Thanks, Adam. Uh, head of Sustainability and Philanthropy for NASDAQ. I've been with the exchange for 15 years. Stock exchanges have been involved in the ESG transparency space for about that long, uh, some a bit longer. And um, our approach to ESG and sustainability has to do with data, has to do with market-driven forces. We want to create a common sense middle ground between investors and companies on the subjects that are important to all of us on the planet. So ESG, uh, environment, social, and governance issues, uh, SDGs, emerging reporting protocols, Everything that has to do with how we measure our responsibility in terms of the planet and society. That's where I work in that space. And I also have a couple of side jobs, as Adam knows. I'm pleased to be on the board of the Network USA for Global Compact and then also part of the Global Sustainability Standards Board for the GRI. So I've worked uh, for quite some time on standards and how standards can be used to drive this conversation forward. Perfect. Uh, and uh, Treasurer. Adam, thanks. Uh, my name is Mike Ferricks. I'm the Illinois State Treasurer. In that role, I'm the Chief Investment Officer for the State of Illinois. We manage somewhere about $32 billion in state funds and pooled municipal funds in addition to college savings funds. In that role, I also serve on the board of the Illinois State Board of Investment, a uh, pension fund for state employees uh, and elected officials. Uh, so our thoughts on sustainability or, or ESG issues is we use a full-scale integration of material, relevant, and industry-specific sustainability factors and put them into our investment decisions. Now, we codified this in the state law last year under the Sustainable Investing Act, and that also applies to other public funds in the state of Illinois. In terms of integration, we integrate sustainability factors into the evaluation of external managers and in our direct purchases. So for things like corporate bonds, commercial paper issuers, supranational bonds, municipal bonds, et cetera. Um, transparency and disclosure, we think is very important. We believe it serves investors and company interests for managers and companies to be transparent, accountable, and robustly report on sustainability risk and opportunities. We can't make good decisions without knowledge. And I say we also adopt an active ownership stance. We engage companies and asset managers on sustainability issues and we vote our proxies in accordance with an active focus on sustainability issues. And we would do better at this if uh, we had better reporting, more transparency. So I want to thank Evan for his work there. Perfect. And uh, Anna, I'll, I'll, we'll have you unmuted for this. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Anna Zubitz-Anderson. I work for Moody's Risk 
group. So my group is actually housed outside of credit rating agency and we're predominantly tasked with uh, non-credit related assessments that are specifically ESG based, so ESG data, ESG assessments, and other related products and services such as second party opinions. Um, we integrate the work of our affiliates, Video Iris um, and 427. Video Iris is a Paris based company and um, they provide ESG data assessments and second party opinions on green sustainability and social bonds. And our affiliate 427 is California based um, and they provide climate data. Perfect. Thank you, Anna. And thing I shared my screen as I was trying to help Sapna join, um, but it looks like we're having a firewall issue. Um, and we're going to try and get her to join via her personal email, um, but we'll proceed. Um, so um, I'd like to start by asking how investors weigh different ESG issues. I am not an investor. I'm not in the investor space. And I imagine many of our attendees in the room today are not as well. So I'd like to uh, ask this from the perspective of, frankly, someone who doesn't know as much about what you're doing as, as um, you do in the, in the, the biz, as it were. Um, so the SDGs are necessarily interrelated. We, we all know that um, and are hearing that more and more um, just today even. Um, and our current crisis can be understood as a series of interrelated crises from health, uh, health pandemic, economic, uh, of equality. And so really the question is, has this moment validated your ESG assumptions or has it forced you to reassess your organizational approaches to ESG? And I'd like to start with Anna uh, with that as a credit analyst to be really helpful to know. Okay, Anna? Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> um, I, will, I will answer the question um, specifically from a perspective of responsible investor and you know a service provider into the, that space, the responsible investment space. Um, so the main change that we've seen as a result of COVID-19 pandemic is really the increased focus in the intensity of the debate around the S factor and ESG. Um, I would say before the crisis happened, you know, the E and the ESG, the environment was very prominent and more prominent and that's where most of the conversation revolved around. But um, in the last few months, we definitely have seen the increasing focus on the social and the increasing understanding, um, you know, of how that plays out real life and also just an appreciation that when um, the social factors do come to bear, um, you know, this can happen in a very rapid and dramatic manner. And so as far as what um, has been validated for us versus the new things that we've learned, you know, I think what's been validated is that going into the crisis, we would have had an expectation that those companies that had uh, robust ESG scores before the crisis probably would fare better in terms of having fewer controversies uh, and being able to respond better to controversies that do occur. And, um, you know, that, that's what we've seen, really. Those companies that had stronger ESG profiles, stronger ESG scores, faced fewer controversies, had more proactive measures in terms of protecting their workers and, and managing human capital than those that didn't. I mean, those companies that had weaker ESG scores had more controversies to face. Um, so I, I, that, would be, that would be my main message here. Perfect. Thank you, and, and I apologize for the, the sound um, for the members of the audience. We're, we're doing the best we can. Um, Evan, could you uh, follow up on that question from Anna? I think um, having Moody's and then, then a, a market like NASDAQ respond to, you know, I'm wondering if your response is similar or different. Uh, similar to an extent. I mean, we have certainly found that um, some of our assumptions around ESG have been validated by the, by the crisis and the chaos in the markets. Uh, mostly the assumption that ESG positive companies, companies that integrate ESG uh, as a mindset and a management discipline are outperforming others because they look at decisions differently, they use data in a different way, they're open to new ideas and how they run their company. So some of the, the assumptions we have around ESG being a good indicator of management excellence have been borne out a little bit by the downturn. But I mean, it, it, everything has gone down and up and down and up. You know, we had a uh, 24 percent downturn in the SP 400 500 during the crisis ESG funds went down a lower amount they went down 17 or 18 percent which is better comparatively but the, all the market was hit by concern and anxiety it's there was no bulletproof equity or bulletproof fund that survived everything perfectly so 
some of those assumptions there may have been sort of upended a little bit. This is not a perfect solution for investment decision making. It helps to drive your investment towards more resilient companies over the long term, and it helps you understand why those companies outperform and how they're outperforming, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to beat the market when the market is so massively disrupted. Um, and I think that what's been reassessed in terms of our mindset as an exchange, as a quasi-regulator, as a convener of, of, of capital, um, what does work mean? What does, you know, the S, I heard Chris Gray in the previous panel talk about the S and ESG. How do we quantify social performance? Because COVID focus has put social performance right in the middle of the conversation right now. So how do we deploy people? How do people work? How do they actually give us their labor in a way that's safe and effective? How does productivity stay strong when you're essentially most of the workforce? So some of those assumptions have been uh, are undergoing reassessment right now, and mostly around can we become more sophisticated in our quantification of social performance? Perfect, Evan. Thank you so much. And, and Treasurer, um, if you'll, I was going to ask you next, but we I see that one of our speakers, our last speaker, uh -huh. Sapna, has been able to join. Um, and Sapna, I'd like to ask that you introduce yourself, um, at your organization, uh, and your organizational approach to ESG, the role you play in the market. Okay, um, thank you, Adam, and uh, apologies, everyone, for my technical issues. Uh, my name is Sapna Shah. I've been at PIMCO for approximately 13 years. Um, over the last two years, I oversee our organization's corporate responsibility efforts, which includes our commitment to the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with PIMCO, we are an investment management firm. Uh, we're global. We have about 17 offices across the world, 2,800 employees, and um, we are fortunate enough to manage approximately $1.8 trillion in assets. Uh, when it comes to our approach to ESG, I think it's the foundation is twofold. One is based on sustainable growth. We really are seeking to take an approach in which we recognize that financial prosperity should not come at the expense of societal good. That's number one. And number two, uh, we recognize we have a fiduciary duty to our clients and that fiduciary duty entails managing risk. Uh, while we've always considered uh, financial, traditional financial metrics when it comes to long-term valuations, increasingly, um, as, the, as, as many of these panelists will agree, uh, ESG-related or non-financial metrics have become increasingly important and material to our assessment of long-term valuations. Uh, so that's our approach to ESG, and we truly hope to partner with people like those on this panel today, the industry, and issuers to help foster, foster a healthy, healthy bond, bond market, market. With, um, other bonds which advance ESG efforts. Sapna, so, as a quick follow-up on the question we were uh, engaged in when you joined, um, has the, the COVID moment and the related crises validated your ESG assumptions, or has it um, forced you to reassess your organizational approaches to ESG? So I wouldn't say, uh, in terms of validation, I wouldn't necessarily use that word. I would say that the S has become increasingly more important, and I think other panelists have alluded to the fact that Perhaps some of the reasons why S may not have been as important before is because data can be challenging to collect. So in some ways at this moment in time, uh, what this moment has allowed us to do is refocus attention on that data collection. And particularly, we see now consumer preferences are changing, policies are changing, work dynamics are shifting. So the S is becoming increasingly important. And um, I, I, before this panel, I spoke to a number of people within the organization to get their thoughts on what we would like PIMCO to talk about when it comes to S. And there are five factors that they uh, that they discussed as, as really being thematic at this moment in time when it comes to S. Uh, and what we're seeking to evaluate as we engage with issuers. One is the health and well-being of employees to ensure that workplaces are fostering safety in the way that they engage. The second is the recognition that work may be reallocated, obviously with more than 30 million unemployed. Uh, when people finally do come back to work, there likely would be a redistribution of how people work and engage in the workforce. And uh, we're engaging with companies to ensure there's a mindfulness around that. The third is that the way people work may permanently change. Uh, one of our credit analysts was referencing a poll whereby three out of five individuals um, prefer now to work from home. And 
to see whether companies can shift nimbly in relation to this is also important. The fourth is as we all work remotely, and um, clearly my technology issues were <laughs> an indication of this, uh, and people shop more online, cybersecurity is increasingly important. So that investment in cybersecurity is I think one big social theme that will be critical. And then the fifth is supply chains and transparency of supply chains. Um, so these five kind of issues related to S are what there's been a focus on. Uh, we, this moment in time validates the critical importance of it. And um, this is also where we're looking to engage. And again, I, I suspect that many of my panelists, um, fellow panelists, have already mentioned these topics. So apologies for any duplication. Thank you very much for that, Sapna. And uh, Treasurer, you know, uh, the state of Illinois is uh, another sizable investor similar to PIMCO, but it takes a very different perspective, I imagine. Uh, the same question to you with regard to your ESG assumptions. Is the current moment changing them, reinforcing them, and how is it impacting them? Well, let me start by saying I, I know in good television, uh, there's a lot of conflict involved. It makes for more interesting viewing, but unfortunately, I can't provide that today. I'm going to agree with a lot of things that my colleagues on the panel have said today uh, were somewhat similar. Where I think I see a difference is in my position, I am elected. And so I tend to run into a lot more conflict. It's uh, one, my job to manage the state's money, but also to be a chief spokesperson for uh, the treasurer's office and why we do what we do. That frequently puts me on uh, <coughs> radio, where I frequently get questions about me pushing my values on these corporations. And I have to remind them, this is not about my personal values, it's about creating value, sustaining value out there. And we look at ESG issues like we do other technical and financial analysis. We look at materiality. We prioritize those issues likely to have a high or medium impact on financial outcomes and ultimately investor performance. So it has to actually affect the company in some way. And if it does, we dig down deep. We have to be industry specific. We focus on sustainability issues as they apply to specific industries. So how climate risks impact electric utilities, or human capital management at major retailers with strong labor presence, or product safety concerns at pharmaceutical companies. We think these are all relevant. We look at systemic issues. So COVID-19 has demonstrated that many companies are exposed to systemic risks. Climate change is another example of systemic risk across industries. And we often take a broader approach on these issues. And we join large investor coalitions focused on comprehensive investor protections. And we also work to petition the SEC to enhance disclosure standards. So your other question was, has this moment validated our ESG assumptions? Yes. COVID clearly has demonstrated the way companies address long-term sustainability issues will impact their resilience and long-term performance. As someone who manages college savings funds, retirement savings funds, our pensions, we're not a short-term investor. We don't care so much about whether a company is making a next quarterly earning ex expectation. Yep. We believe that COVID-19 will lead to more institutional investors to commit more capital towards sustainability, given performance and evolving stakeholder attitudes. When companies do things like increase healthcare benefits, hike pay for workers on front lines, lower executive compensation to help avoid layoffs, and take extra steps to protect workers and consumer safety, we think they will benefit from having a more engaged and productive workforce and a more loyal consumer base during a recovery. So if anything, it has solidified uh, our support of ESG. Great, thank you very much for that, Treasurer. Um, we're getting a, a lot of good chat in the uh, chat uh, at the side of the session. I'm gonna do my best to integrate questions into um, what are already our set questions, but there are ways to integrate them, so I will do my best, um, although there are many coming in. And for the speakers, if you feel compelled to respond to one of the questions in the chat box, please do feel free to do so. Um, for the next question, I'd like to start with Anna, um, both because it will allow me to resolve the technical issues uh, up front, um, but also because I think this is a good question for you to respond to. Uh, and that is, you know, how are investor priorities changing? Um, not just how your uh, ESG assumptions, but how are investor priorities changing? And what do you see changing in the companies you assess? Um, what are the key drivers 
And one thing to, to maybe add on to that to include a question from the audience is, um, are you seeing the uh, institutional investor um, priorities change uh, in a different way than individual investors? Sure, thank you right now. Yes. Hey, I think, I mean, to, to just build upon what I said earlier, which is um, a growing focus on the S dimension, the social dimension, and understanding how it plays out, you know, I think we had an opportunity to see what kind of companies get more affected by this kind of crisis. So, for example, um, our affiliate Visio Iris has done a study as to what kind of industries um, get got more impacted by controversies related to COVID-19, and they concluded it was certain industries, you know, such as hotel, um, and others, but they were they were they were quite overrepresented by blue collar workforce, you know. So it's it's sort of dynamics like that that um, we we got an opportunity to understand what kind of companies get more exposed. And I think related to that, um, you know, we saw investors become more vocal in terms of what kind of actions they expect companies to take. So there was a statement from um, the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. The, along with that, there were others. For example, there was a joint statement by the Mining Impact Investments Interface Center for Corporate Responsibilities and Office of the New York Controller. There was a statement around what kind of actions, such as flexible um, work arrangements, paid leave, and efforts to maintain employment um, that investors were expecting companies to take. So I think um, the change on the investor side is just from a responsible investment perspective. There is there is more um, investors are becoming more vocal and more active in terms of communicating their expectations for what they want companies to do. And as part of um, as far as companies are concerned, I think we're seeing more focus on the side of the corporates on communicating effectively with their stakeholders. Um, even before the COVID crisis, there has been a growing importance and in an increase in sustainability reporting. We've seen um, corporate social uh, social responsibility reporting increase from about 20% of S&P 500 companies in 2011 to about 90% of companies now. Um, so there is growing focus on sustainability reporting and more and more companies are participating in that conversation. And I think following this crisis, there is even more um, uh, more focus on that, more, more focus on the on part of the corporates to communicate effectively with their stakeholders about what they're doing around sustainability and social dimension in particular. Perfect. And, uh, thank you very much. And I'll put you back on mute to um, deal with the sound. Um, uh, Sapna or, or Treasurer uh, Frerig, um do either of you want to take on uh, this question and follow up? You know, are investor priorities changing? Um, what are the key drivers? Sapna, it looks like you're about to speak. I, I'm happy to start. It's hard to read the room on a, in, a, in a virtual uh, environment. Okay. I'm happy to start, and I'm speaking from the context of an investment manager. We've definitely seen accelerated interest in ESG with regards to client inquiries. Um, now, not just in the context of uh, our role as an investment manager, but even when we speak to our credit research analysts, the way that they engage also is more holistic in the context of ESG factors. Um, this has also led to broader discussions about data collection efforts, and it's also led to a lot of uh, asset owners really wanting to be very aligned in terms of kind of their brand and what they're actually doing underneath the hood with their investment portfolios. So at least from an institutional perspective, the kind of things that we are seeing are people reviewing their assets, seeing if it is aligned with the type of messaging they themselves as a company um, are seeking to project. Uh, the brand, I think, piece is a key driver for a number of companies. Uh, the second piece definitely is the regulatory environment, particularly in the EU, which has definitely accelerated interest in ESG, and as Anna mentioned, ESG reporting. Uh, a third thing is, as us as asset managers uh, become more interested in ESG issues, the way we engage with companies also changes, which has also kind of accelerated differences. And, and again, that goes back to the reporting piece Anna mentioned. I mean, the last thing I'll, I'll talk about in terms of what's kind of fostering that change is clearly current events. You know, right now we are in the midst of some you know, deeply disturbing, upsetting, um, news items related to racial inequity and social justice. 
and companies have had to self-reflect in terms of what this means um, in terms of their role in society. And I think clearly that's also kind of accelerating the conversation when it comes to ESG more broadly and, and S in particular. Thank you for, for raising that point, Sapna. Um, Treasurer, did you want to expand on investor priorities and, and how you see them evolving or not evolving? Yeah, I'd say we see a heightened the importance of strong governance structures. So well, that's the accountability. You know, we're continuing to push, we did before, but independent board chairs offer advantages to uh, governance uh, companies. Uh, transparency, again, I'll sound like a broken record. More disclosure, though, we'd like to see on workforce and operations to help with some of the, those S metrics. Uh, policies and processes, things we're looking at, and a clear delineation of responsibilities within uh, organizations. You know, our asset allocation, we love to take a long-term view, 20, 30, or 40 years. Uh, we think the diversified asset classes, still very important. Um, and it's helpful to understand target allocation ranges and rebalancing in these times. Uh, we're very interested in manager due diligence, uh, understanding liquidity and manager lineup, understanding impact given the pandemic. Uh, we're also very much interested in monitoring fees, vigilantly monitoring fees and maintaining competitiveness. You know, I think I said earlier how this has uh, solidified our support for ESG. You know, people who believe in ESG and they're going to look and see data that says, look, we were right. Companies that are monitoring these other risk factors, weather the storm better, doesn't mean they were making money, but weather the storm better the ones that didn't. However, I do sense that there's still some folks out there who have a knee-jerk reaction to this. I can tell you as much as people on maybe on this call focus on the E or the S, there's some people who hear that environmental or social and their ears closed. They're turned off. And they say, no, it's not your job to push these values. And so I think at a time when markets have collapsed at times, uh, those people are going to see that as evidence backing their belief. See, no, we just need to focus on making money out here. We don't, we can't afford your uh, your liberal values being pushed in these companies right now. So I do see a widening gap between those who support ESG and feel that there is data to support them, and non-believers who have a great fear that keeps them from embracing. Perfect. Thank you. And and maybe to touch on. Um, a bit of the comments you made there, and, and frankly, incorporating um, in, in some way some questions from the audience, I think it could best be asked um, to Evan now about the gap between ESG believers and non-believers. Um, you know, Evan, feel free to, to continue to respond to the question of changing priorities, but I think uh, through the lens of, you know, those that already um, believed in the, the value of E, S, and G issues, um, they're going to see, as, as the treasurer said, they're going to see this the, this current moment reinforcing, uh, you know, that assessment. Um, is the gap between those who believe in ESG as having value and those that don't is that is that um, widening or, or is it shrinking? Uh, well, I can't really add too much to what the treasurer and what you have just said. I think that the gap has widened to some extent. If you were a believer before, then you see the connections between ESG and crisis thinking and crisis management. You see all these ways that companies can outperform and use data to manage their workforce, manage their facilities, manage their physical footprint in ways that are just smarter than others. And if you were not a believer before, if you thought that ESG was a bolt-on exercise or a reporting burden that had nothing to do organically with the operation of your business, it's been pushed to priority 20 on a list of 20s uh, because they have to get on with the business of making money and they're not really aware of the fact that ESG is about the fundamental levers of business and making money and doing things in a smart and efficient way. So it's widened the gap philosophically in that sense. If you are already bought in, you're, you're doubling down. If you weren't bought in, you've pushed it to the bottom of the priority list. Um, I just think that's the, the situation that we're in right now. And we have to sort of bring both sides to the table. We can't just have the large companies fix this problem. We can't just have the believers in these dialogues. We need to bring everybody to the table so that we can fix it because uh, without the without the long tail of the small companies, without the supply chains that feed those larger companies, and without the investors that have, you know, for better or, or worse, not really been investing their values, um, unless they come to the table, we don't, the, the problems, the scale of the problem is too much that we want. Wonderful. Thank you, Evan. And if I could follow up on that question to you, uh, and then we'll open it up to the others. Um, 
is this the right moment to operationalize ESG as an investable metric? Um, and or is that too opportun opportunistic? And, and to put it in terms that I think those of us, including myself, who are not in the investment community, um, you know, what that might mean there is really, is this the right time to actually integrate ESG into investment priorities um, across the border? Or, or is that too opportunistic? Is this the right moment? Or um, is there still work that needs to be done? Um, well, I've been thinking about this ever since we raised it on the prep call. And I, I listened to Safna talk very movingly about what's going on in the country right now. Social unrest, racial inequality, uh, rampant organizational sexism and uh, transphobia, all kinds of things that are contributing to a widening gap between people and their true selves and, and the concept of doing work at, in a collaborative experience. Um, so yes, it is a bit opportunistic to seize on these opportunities to talk about social unrest and how finance can fix it, or racial in inequity and how business can fix it, or the global climate change and how the SDGs can fix it. But you know what? We have no choice. We're out of time. We don't have a buffer left to play around the margins and to spare people's feelings. It's a bit cruel to say it this way, but we have to move forward and risk people feeling like it is opportunistic because the problem is so great that we can't sit on the sidelines for a year or two to perfect the language. We have to find a way to engage on these issues right now. Yeah. Um, uh, Treasurer, Safna, Anna, any of you want to um, uh, comment on whether um, ESG should be, can be operational as an investable metric now or if it's too opportunistic? If, if anything, it's 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 yeah, kind of here. late. Uh, the, the right time to to oh, to, okay. to uh, okay. incorporate ESG uh, is like yesterday. Yeah, are you trying to speak? I can't tell. I am. Okay. I can't. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can hear you. Um, um, it's not echo. Not echo but it's no, I, I was just making a comment that the right time to incorporate ESG into uh, investment strategy was probably yesterday. Uh, <laughs> You know, we, we have uh, we have sustainable development goals, and there is a great challenge for us to to achieve a sustainable economy across the globe. Um, the investment necessary is very significant, and sustainable finance and responsible investment have a very important role to play. So I think, you know, now is the right time. Yesterday was the right time, and tomorrow is the right time too. I agree that I agree with um, Anna that is probably overdue. Um, and I will just say more kind of, uh, and perhaps this is me just being hopeful and optimistic, but I don't necessarily think that the gap between ESG believers and non-believers has to widen at this time. Like uh, in the last few months, when there was market distress, ESG portfolios did relatively well. So for those who uh, have even a, a values-based disagreement with the concept of ESG, they can't necessarily argue against performance metrics. And so over its time, kind of time passes and ESG continues to prove its worth through performance. I'm optimistic that the gap will narrow over time. Uh, I'll just say, uh, yes, it's a good time. Yes, it's a good time. Are you hearing an echo? Are you hearing an echo? No, 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 you said you sound great. Okay, great. We already integrate ESG factors into our investment decision making. So I, I think you're right that yesterday, today, or tomorrow are all good times. Uh, but as Anna said, uh, yesterday was the best time. Today is second best. Uh, if you haven't already, get it going forward. I, I think that gap is because we're not necessarily looking at the same data or not looking at the same numbers. Both sides will look at numbers to make their case. I believe ours is the right way. I think they're looking at the wrong set. I think part of it is a misunderstanding of how we evaluate here. So sustainability factors are not the only metric we consider, but it is critically important to factor them in uh, along with traditional technical and financial analysis. I think there are some investors out there who reject this and say, well, um, we've looked at traditional financial analysis, tr traditional technical analysis, and that has served us well. And if we just focus double down, that will help round the curve here. What we want them to understand is ESG is adding an additional layer to enhance the rigor of our analyses and take a broader view on investment risk and opportunities. I think there's this feeling that there's a trade-off, whereas I think that our ESG analysis complements the traditional work we do and that other investors have done for a long time. 
Great, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm going to try, try and incorporate a, um, some questions from the audience because we have a, a really, really robust, robust chat happening. happening and, um, forgive me if I'm not able to include your specific question. I'm just trying to get to as many as I can in here. Um, but as um, Jay Hartling in the audience uh, rightly notes that one of the speakers in the morning's plenary noted the need for regulation around ESG. And I know that's a touchy and tricky subject, but I wanted to, to ask um, those of you on the panel, um, what role regulation can or should play in this, whether it's even needed to achieve um, the, the world we want as envisioned by the SDGs. Um, and then as an addendum to that question, um, incorporating another question from the audience, um, in terms of the, the ESG competencies of board and, and uh, C-suite leadership at companies, you know, how critical that is, um, you know, and whether that even needs to be regulated. Um, I don't know who would want to take that first. I saw a nice nod and a, a little bit of a smirk from Evan, so I'm inclined to go to you first. Um, Anna, I think you're going to go next, but it's hard to read the, the choppiness of the video, so we'll go to you right after this. Uh, Evan? Well, I'm sort of prohibited from question on the US SEC part. I have an opinion about regulation in general, which is that it has driven the conversation forward. We've seen regulatory impulse from Asia and the EU in particular that has helped with the quantification of social, We've got the EU non-financial reporting directive. We've got the taxonomy initiative going on there. So I think that market forces and regulation have to work hand in hand. Hopefully neither one too far behind or ahead of the other. And I think that has helped in, that has happened in most of the world. I won't get into the U.S. in particular, but uh, I think that it is, there, there are always going to be outliers. There are always going to be people who do not want to report unless they have to. And there's always going to be a fractured, data landscape unless you have a harmonized or universal structure. So I'm not suggesting that we have one framework globally for ESG. I think a lot of the ones that have emerged have value and meaning in and of themselves, but we do have to get better at making those readings, those ratings comparable and consistent so that investors can make smart decisions. Right now, it, it, the data landscape is so fractured, like I said, that it's very difficult to make meaningful decisions. Rick, Anna, oh, sorry. Thing, thing, thing. Thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you, um, you, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to echo Evan's comments around um, uh, reporting and, and reporting standards. I, I actually I started my career in audit. I worked for KPMG for eight years. So I come from accounting background, and I always like to say that ESG data space reminds me of how accounting was maybe a couple centuries ago. <laughs> you know, we have some ways to go in terms of consistency of information and agreement that we can reach on what is important to us to measure. Um, we are asking the financial system to do something that it hasn't been doing before, you know, measure the sort of things that was not designed to measure. So this is very new and part of the problem we have right now is that there's so many different languages that people use and so many different metrics that companies use to report on ESG. We really need some standardization and consistency around that. We do have some voluntary global standards that are commonly in use, you know, there is CDP, there is GRI, there are SESB, um, there are others. And I think what we need is just more consistency and more harmonization and sort of move it, movement towards an approach where we can have, um, you know, at least global consistent market practice around what is reported and how it's measured, um, a common language. Obviously, yeah. regulators. Oh, thank you. Um, thank I'd you. like um, to, kind of like to continue, continue on that continue. line of thought and uh, including some more questions from the audience um, and related uh, for, for Satna and Michael. Um, how much confidence can investors place in ESG scores? And related to that, um, you know, there are companies that may be perceived as uh, reporting uh, favorably on ESG, but maybe um, are not understood to be actually following through on, on the, um, ESG issues in their operations. Um, and that disparity between scoring um, and, and actual practice. Um, would either of you like to comment on that? Would you, uh, uh, I'm happy to comment, although I would say I'm, I'm super interested in this response from an asset owner like the treasurer, but I can tell you, working within an investment management organization, um, I think it is extremely challenging to assess from the outside the validity of how kind of ESG scores are utilized, because oftentimes, um, one, kind of the data that's sourced may be proprietary or not, the way the data is processed may be proprietary or not. The way the different ESG factors across industries are applied um, 
are different and probably differ manager to manager. And so there are a number of factors which contribute to kind of how these ESG scores are developed. And it's not really easy to tell uh, one manager from another in terms of whether one model is, is more valid than the other, unless you truly go deep into their processes. So I think asset owners and um, Importantly, I think I probably think more about the individual retail investor who has to make this decision. Uh, really, they do have uh, the challenge, uh, quite a challenge to do their due diligence appropriately. Uh, that being said, I do think many organizations have thought very deeply about this. There is a desire not only by, by PIMCO, but the industry to put some standardization around some of these metrics. And as such, we partner with many of you in various industry organizations. <clears throat> um, but to get to the second question about, OK, let's say that somebody has a great ESG score. How can you really tell that that's actually um, the case within the company itself? Uh, I sit in a seat where I'm trying to push ahead a lot of these metrics within our own organization and to truly institutionalize ESG considerations within the fabric of the organization oftentimes is a multi-year process. Uh, being able to establish kind of metrics that are trackable over time is clearly one aspect of it. Uh, but a lot of this does have to do with something that unfortunately is a bit more intangible and, and not as quantifiable, which is the culture and whether the culture truly embraces ESG. And I do think in that capacity, conversations with the C-suite um, is important. Uh, and, and then that goes back again to how does your asset manager not only utilize quantitative methods to come up with an ESG score, but engage with organizations in their evaluation of um, the uh, sincerity of their ESG efforts. I apologize. Um, okay, you can hear me now. Thank you. Um, yeah. Technical issues for us all. Um, so uh, just to repeat the question briefly, uh, Treasurer, uh, and, and to you, um, you know, how are investors, um, or rather, how much confidence can you place in ESG scores uh, and whether you perceive a disparity between scores and actual practice and how you might adjust for that? Well, a couple of things. I think we do need better transparency, better standardization across industries. I am a little concerned about having broad brush. I mean, I think uh, someone who works in government at Bosman and says, but sometimes government will paint with too broad of a brush. And in different industries, certain things are more material and more relevant than in others. And so we'd like to see corporations come together in certain industries and do a better job of disclosure. So that's something that can be done there, but in house, um, we need to do a better job as well. You know, we need to we need to make sure that we're diving in, that we're not allowing greenwashing and just checking boxes that say, okay, look, they met these standards, uh, but to really conduct some analysis. So we need to further refine our evaluation and engagement of asset managers on sustainability topics. So right now, we conduct due diligence to evaluate the scope and quality of each manager's approach to sustainability. Uh, we work with them fairly frequently. This includes an evaluation of ESG integration, company analysis, engagement, and their proxy voting activities. This includes the role of the board in overseeing ESG activities. Uh, but I believe that there's more that can be done to do this better to enhance the way in which we evaluate and engage our asset managers on ESG topics. Uh, we can't know everything, but we shouldn't just sit back and uh, take a scorecard or a report card uh, and declare success. Great. Thank you very much. Um, to try and synthesize some of the questions coming in, um, there's a question here about um, what investors can do to encourage more sustainable behaviors uh, amongst the companies they're investing in. And I, I imagine that's a very tri tricky topic. Um, and I'm wondering if there, that, you know, how that might be able to occur um, and if there are um, ways outside of regulation that you think could be promoted. Um, I'm gonna to go to Evan for this one. I have a feeling you might have a good response. Tell me again, which way you wanna take this question because I, I have a personal opinion, but then I also have a market-based opinion. What are we driving at with this question? Let's go. 
Um, I mean, we'd love to hear both. I mean, I think the idea is, um, look, we have some incredible speakers on the panel here today representing different perspectives from, from across the market. Um, but clearly, we're not doing what we need to do uh, in order to transform the overall economy. Uh, investors have um, incredible power in driving the, the focus. Um, and so the question is then, how do we, how do we move it and can investors play that role? Um, and so your professional opinion would be really welcome. Yeah, I mean, I work with investors and companies every day. So clearly investors have a role to play. They have played that role to date in terms of data transparency, wanting more data, you know, uh, making the case pretty uh, uh, confidently that ESG data is a part of their decision making now. So it is worked into algorithms, it's worked into their decisions, it's worked into their portfolios in various percentages and at various degrees based on what they think is right. Um, I think they could do more. I think that uh, looking at portfolio transparency for investors who have signed on to the PRI, for example, uh, looking at patterns of engagement, um, I'm only calling out BlackRock because they're the largest and, and, and the biggest on the block. But you know, for years they have put out a letter asserting their their uh, beliefs in this space, but we have very little insight into their engagement with listed companies uh, around ESG. We know that they care about these issues, but we don't see that caring uh, represented in terms of performance data. And coming from the point of view of the, of the public company, where the burden has been on their transparency for years and years and years, tell us that you're doing something, prove to us that you're responsible, tell us what your ESG uh, aspirations are. I'd like some of that, some of that group me to shift over to the investor side, because I think it's warranted. And I think that between the two, those are the right forces that drive this, uh, drive this transparency question together at scale. And you know, just one more thing before we leave the ESG rating space, I, I take the uh, the comments of the of the treasurer at face value. I do think that there's a problem with the ESG rating space, and I hear from from public companies all the time, which is this is a boom, and they are overwhelmed in terms of measuring these companies too. You often have the, the same data presented by two different ratings uh, uh, raters, and they come up with wildly different scores for that company. I don't think that it's necessarily malevolent. I don't think it's necessarily that they have bad methodologies. They just have a limited team trying to put their heads around a very big topic. Uh, the data landscape for this is unstructured and very large. So sometimes we seek sort of like a negative perspective on why companies are rated the way they are. I think it's because this is an evolving space and a lot of people are trying to figure out where the meaning is. Thank you, Evan. And Satna, I'm seeing what I, I, I perceive to be the pains of recognition um, in your response to, to Evan talking. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, no, I was just going to say that um, I, I agree with what Evan says. I can't emphasize the um, critical importance of asset owners like the treasurer of the state of Illinois and others, public funds, corporates, sovereign wealth funds. The more they care about these issues and push standardization or have their own specific requests around these issues, that really truly is an impetus of change for organizations like us. Uh, so they are critically important. Um, that being said, also to the point uh, that Evan made, uh, it can be difficult managing around a lot of custom requests associated with ESG issues too. So we are kind of in a place where I think everybody has the right intent, everybody knows where they want to go, but the devil is always in the details. And so uh, I truly, I think some of these industry partnerships um, even if, if even if it takes a while to converge into some set sort of standards that are accepted uh, more uniformly, I think they're very, very critical. And I just emphasize that point. Thank you, Sapna. I, I would love to go to Anna now, uh, it's coming from a raider, but it seems like we've lost her. Um, so, uh, Treasurer Farage, um, I, I'm wondering if you wanted to add anything. It seemed like you um, were nodding along to some pieces of that. Yeah, I was, and this is probably a little late in there, but the CH at the end is a, like a K as in school, Frerix. Okay. Uh, I should have said it <laughs> there are many, many ways for investors to engage. Uh, and, and you're right, like the, uh, when we're looking at climate risk, it presents a different position to some of the financial services industry as say ExxonMobil. And uh, I, I worry that we may make all corporations disclose so many things that Right. They don't have the uh, time or resource to do them right, but we know that there are some that are much more material and relevant. 
in specific industries. And our hope is our that hope they, is uh, that they uh, do a better job of disclosing there. But some of the things you can do is direct engagement with corporations. Uh, last year, we introduced a shareholder proposal in 2019 requesting the board of directors of Johnson & Johnson issue a report describing the measures the company has implemented to monitor and manage risks related to opioid crisis. The proposal won 61% support amongst company shareholders, and the office continues to work, our office, work with J&J to enhance oversight and reporting on opioid risk measures. So I think that's important, uh, important victory uh, in terms of the S in uh, ESG. You know, I think that investors who want to make a difference if they think that they're too small or they're not be taking uh, maybe given enough consideration, look for some sort of way to work together. So the Treasurer's Office has taken over the leadership of the Midwest Investors Diversity Initiative. It's a 13-member investor coalition working to increase racial and gender diversity on corporate boards of Midwest companies. We focus on a place where we're located, where we have better relationships. And since 2016, when the group was formed, MIDI has engaged 54 companies, 40 of which have added diverse board members, and 32 have adopted diverse search policies. And then we just think, you know, another important thing to do is to sign on with a lot of these groups out there. Uh, we were the first ever public treasury to sign the Principles for Responsible Investment, PRI. The Tre yeah. Treasurer's Office made history as the first ever public treasury to become a member of PRI in 2018. We think not only is this a milestone, it's an important step that strengthens our ability to protect and grow investment returns. The initiative was started by the UN and now includes over 3,000 global signatories among asset managers and owners. So if, uh, if there's an investor out there who's not sure where to begin, there are many different ways to engage and many uh, others who would like to work with you. And, and just a, a follow-up note on PRI, uh, UN PRI, the Principles of Responsible Investment, is a sister initiative of the UN Global Compact uh, with principles guiding um, really how companies are investing. So there are companies that are members of both PRI and the Global Compact, and we, uh, our, our leaders sit on each other's board. So it's a very close relationship. And um, if you're interested in connecting with PRI but don't know how, you could also reach out to us at the Global Compact. We're happy to connect you. Um, with our remaining few minutes, I wanted to just quickly go across the panel, and starting with Anna, just to resolve any uh, sound issues in advance, to ask one final closing question. Um, and that is, what is your one ask of our audience, particularly the corporates in the audience, and uh, related, what's one thing that you can do better um, in your organization to assess value or redefine risk? Uh, Anna, I'll, I'll start with you. One, one ask of the audience and one reflection on your own uh, work. Sure, thank you. You can hear me now? Um, so, so, I think I just want to start with an acknowledgement. I know what we're talking about here is asking um, management to do is really go beyond managing the balance sheet and manage a lot of different stakeholder expectations. Um, and this, these are very challenging trade-offs and obviously is more of an art than a science. And I think if I have one question for the audience, it would be you right when you're about to ask to, uh, I think we just lost you right when you're about to ask Could you repeat Do you have me? Okay. Am I back now? Yeah, my question is the most the most difficult uh, trade-off that they had to make through the crisis between stakeholder expectations. Thank you. Um, Sapna, Thank you. Um, what's one question, question you asked of, uh, what's of one question you ask and what's one reflection on um, what PIMCO could be doing better to assess value and, and risk? I think for every organization and, and, and PIMCO as well, we need to um, think about as assets, as the evaluation of assets transitions from like tangible assets that the organization has to the more intangible, the people, the brand, and what are the measures that the company is putting in place to kind of truly create accountability and metrics around those factors. And, and, and that's why I say it's the same question. The one that I would ask to corporates is the same one that I would, I would ask of ourselves, that we really seek to be as thoughtful and integrated as we approach not only responsible investment business. And I think that requires a lot of self-reflection, institutionalization of processes, a long-term commitment. Perfect. Thank you very much, Safna. Treasurer, same question to you. 
Uh, we think there are many reporting frameworks that can help companies. But we believe SASB offers a valuable model for companies to consider. Uh, this identifies material and relevant issues and encourages the development and disclosure of metrics to demonstrate the company's progress towards managing sustainability issues. Uh, we are excited by the progress we've seen with SASB. We are excited by progress going forward, and maybe that's a good uh, lead into Evan. Evan, are you said, do you say you're on the board of SASB? <laughs> no, I do. In? So, no. I might go the other way on that question. Uh, GRI has been around for a very long time. It is the only one that's in stock exchange listing rules right now, and it's used by many, many thousands more companies than SASB. But they're both meaningful and useful reporting protocols just with slightly different you know, aims one is narrow and industry and sector specific one is broad but anyway to adam's question um the one asked would be uh, related to data i think the companies need to report as much as they can whenever they can to the stakeholders that matter for them use the materiality threshold and process to decide who those stakeholders are and what the data should be for you don't just blindly follow a framework integrate them into your process and then the one thing for me for markets would be to help drive that data discussion forward. Uh, reporting should be not just universal and harmonized, but relevant and meaningful for decision makers. And that's not just for investors. That's for exchanges, that's for public companies, that's for employees, which we often leave out of this conversation, as they evaluate where they work and how they spend their time. Customers and clients who are a voice in this process as well. But we need to empower all of these stakeholders to sort of act on their values and to go forward in a way that's meaningful for them, not just rattle sabers and not just post on social media about how outraged they are. We need to create decision-making apparatus based on ESG data. Perfect, thank you, Evan. And that will have to be our last word. I'd like to once again thank each of our speakers for joining us, um, as well as our audience for bearing with us through these technical challenges, but for, for contributing to this great panel. Thank you, and I wish you all um, a very uh, engaging and successful rest of your time at this, the 20th Anniversary Leader Summit. Thank you very much, and, and we'll see you in the virtual conference. Thank you, Adam. Thank you all.